Hello, everyone. Welcome to Blue Ridge Prism's winter meeting. Um, we're just going to wait a couple minutes for people to sign in and join us. We have um, quite a few people signed up to join us today, so we just want to give them a chance. Um, while you're waiting for them to um, sign in, why don't you go ahead and sign into chat and say hello and let us know where you're um, dialing in from. We'd love to hear. Welcome again. We're so glad you're here with us. Georgia. Yay. Shout out to folks in Lafayette, Indiana. Hershey, Pennsylvania. Yeah. yeah, there you go. <laughs> I'm a fellow Hoosier. Cape Charles. Hello, Baltimore, Iowa, Maryland. This is always such, this is like one of my favorite parts of our webinars is to, to see who's typing in. I love seeing all the different people coming in. Yeah, yeah. All of our Virginia peeps, glad you could join us today. The, the screen's moving so fast. I, I, <laughs> it's hard for me to uh, pick out specific uh, names. Nashville. Georgia. Georgia, Pennsylvania. <laughs> what are we up to? 360. Another That's Toronto. Good. Yeah, we're international. There you go. There you go. Texas. Good. San Antonio. Yeah. Cool. Still Welcome. Tennessee. West Virginia. Hi, Jen, and it's Mary McLean. <laughs> so, friends are reconnecting through our chat. Another Toronto. Interesting. Yeah. That's like at least three. Hello, Asheville, North Carolina. I often go to Blowing Rock, North Carolina. I bet you it's a little colder there today. Yeah. Hey, Virginia Whitmer. Rowena, um, it's 11.31. Do you want to go ahead okay. and kick us off? Yes, I will. So. So welcome, everyone. Um, we are so happy to have you here with us today at um, the our Blue Ridge Prism 2023 winter meeting. Um, we just want to, um, I'm sorry, I, I'm like looking at the chat at the same time and trying to talk, but anyway, um, I'm Rowena Zimmerman and I'm the Director of Communications and Outreach for Blue Ridge Prism. And I'm also joined today by Rod Walker, who's our president, who's going to give a um, brief Prism update and our executive director, Beth Mizell, along with our Prism volunteers, Jim Harley, Tim Maywalt, and William Hamerski, who are going to um, help answer your questions in the Q&A throughout the meeting. Um, today, Blue Ridge Prism is so pleased to host our panel of experts, Nicola McGough, who's the owner of Wild Ginger Field Services based in Charlottesville, um, Laura Greenleaf, um, who is an invasive plant management coordinator for the James River Park System in Richmond, and Nicole Schumann, um, who's the Agricultural and Natural Resources Agent with the Virginia Cooperative Extension in Goodson County. Um, thanks to each of them for being here today. Um, I think we're really in for a great conversation and we've all looked through the questions and um, there's, there's a wide range and we're really excited to talk about it. So a few things before we get started. Um, closed captioning has been enabled and um, so you'll be able to um, see what um, everyone is saying, I hope. Um, but first, I want to talk about our upcoming online events. Um, these are just a few of them. Um, not all of them have been finalized for the entire year, but we hope that uh, for these that we have on the screen that you can put them on your calendar and join us. We'd love to have you. Um, next coming up is our Spotter Lanternfly Egg Mass Survey Training. And that should be, um, that's for citizen scientists to learn how to um, survey the egg masses so we can help um, 
get information on how widespread the spotted lanternfly is in Virginia. We also have our spring quarterly meeting in April with David Coyle, who is an expert about calorie pair. And as you can read further for, for the rest, but we're really excited about um, all of the meetings that are coming up. It's just a quick um, slide of our brown bag webinar and you can sign up and the information for that is on our website, blueridgeprism.org. Um, if you have audio issues, um, just take a look at these slides to make sure that you've done everything that you can to, um, you know, join with the computer via Zoom, make sure you're hooked up to the right speakers, et cetera. And once again, the closed captioning is enabled. So hopefully you can read um, what everyone's saying at the bottom of your screen. Zoom tips. Um, if you have questions for our Q&A that you want our panel to answer, please make sure you direct them to the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. If you just want to say where you're from and say hello or share information with everyone else in this meeting, go ahead and type that into the chat. And um, we're not able, we got so many questions and we're so um, grateful for all of them, but we're not able to answer every single one that we got, but we want to answer your question. So if we have not answered your question today, please feel free to contact us at info at blueridgeprism.org and we'll make sure to get back to you. Also, if you wanna find out more information about Blue Ridge Prism, follow us on our website, as well as on Facebook and Instagram. Um, now I want to introduce um, Rod Walker, who's the president of Blue Ridge Prism. And Rod, I guess you wanna share your screen, right? Yes, I'm, uh, uh, you, you wanna take down yours? Yes, I will take mine down. And Rod's going to do just a quick update on Prism business for us today. Okay. Good morning, everybody. I'm uh, I'm, I'm pleased to uh, yeah, have have you all here today, and, and, and in addition to our esteemed uh, speakers, I'm trying to get rid of. Uh, there we go, move some things out of my way. And this is gonna be a very short update uh, on the Blue Ridge Prism activities and a, and a quick introduction for those of you who are new to the Blue Ridge Prism. Uh, the mission of the Prism is to reduce the impact of invasive species in our targeted geography, which covers 12 counties, uh, covering over a, a little over three and a half million acres, including the Shenandoah National Park. And we believe we've got more than 50,000 landowners that have 50,000, that have 5,000 acres or more. Doesn't mean we don't care about the people with less than that, but that just gives you a feel for the, the size of the undertaking. Yeah, here's a picture showing the 10 counties, you know, Nelson and Augusta to the south, up along the Blue Ridge, up to the uh, you know, West Virginia, Maryland borders with uh, Clark and Loudoun County. Uh, so it's uh, a little over 3.6 million acres. Uh, here's the people who are involved in the PRISM. We have an advisory board listed here on the on the left. Uh, you can see it's a great great list of uh, uh, involved organizations, as well as there's other organizations we work with fairly closely and or from time to time. And some of those are are listed here on the right. Uh, you know, we're 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 blessed with a great partner uh, ecosystem, and uh, uh, it, it helps us <laughs> immensely in terms of getting anything done. In terms of the, the major activities of the PRISM, we have two major activities. Uh, one is a focus on our home geography, where we uh, educate, inspire, and, and try and help landowners in the 12 counties uh, in their efforts to remove and replace the invasive plants. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about more of that in a second. Uh, in addition, uh, in, in the last you know, several years, uh, we've been taking more and more actions to try to address the invasive plant problem across the entire state. And we'll talk about some of that in here in just a second as well. In terms of our landowner targeted activities, uh, we have quarterly meetings. This is one of them. Uh, they're done by a video conference. We have tabling events at other people's events where we set up a, a booth and, and uh, answer people's questions and hand out materials. Uh, we didn't do much of that, of course, during the pandemic. Uh, but uh, we're, we're doing a little bit more of that and uh, happy to do more of it as, as time goes on. The, uh, 
uh, speaking engagements. If you have a group and you'd like to have us come in and be a speaker for your group, that's uh, something we do. We're doing several of those uh, as, as time goes on here. Uh, we used to do a lot of them and uh, we're, we're now open for business there. Uh, we do workshops three times a year. So this is where you can come learn how to identify invasive plants and the different methods for controlling them. Some of this is done, with the uh, some of the presentations are done by Zoom, uh, but some of the, the training is done hands-on uh, in person. Uh, we do brag, brown bag lunches. Uh, Rowena listed a couple of those coming up. Uh, these are occasional one-hour topics. Uh, they, they can be really interesting. We publish quarterly newsletters. There's lots of materials on our website that you can download. And if you ever have any questions, including what's this plant, uh, you can send questions or photos to info at blueridgeprism.org. Uh, I'll, I'll say a few more words about our landowner services. We've got two people uh, who are now available to go out and visit on site with landowners on your property. Uh, just for perspective, uh, we had over 3,000 uh, attendees uh, at our events last year, uh, and we now have over 4,300 people you know, on our email list. So, and, and that's typically growing by 500 to 1,000 a year. So, it's, uh, it's, a, it's in that sense, it's a booming business. Uh, so, some key statewide activities. Uh, we kicked off a study two years ago with the Virginia Department of Transportation. Yeah, where they're surveying plants. Uh, they're using having uh, Virginia Tech survey plants at hundreds of sites around the state uh, and you know, coming back with recommendations on native plants to be used uh, in VDOT's uh, you know, construction projects and maintenance activities uh, instead of the mostly non-natives that's on their planting list today. Uh, we're constantly looking at, at getting more plants on the Virginia noxious weeds list. Uh, there's 12 of them currently in process. They're listed here. In another year or two, hopefully they'll be added to the official legal list of invasive plants or noxious weeds, excuse me. Uh, we have a drone project uh, with UVA to have a very special drone fly over you know, properties to uh, map specific species of plants by analyzing the reflected light. Uh, that project's been underway for a couple of years. The first uh, peer-reviewed scientific journal paper uh, should be getting published here in the next few weeks, and there will be more papers to come. Uh, the technology is looking, you know, I would say, promising. Stay tuned. Uh, and you know, spotted lanternfly is, is a hot topic, and uh, you know, we're trying to get people to pay more attention to it and actually take out their lanthus in particular you know, before the bug arrives. And if any of you have an interest in forming another prism uh, that covers other counties in the state, we'd be happy to help you do that. Uh, some a, a couple of quick highlights from uh, uh, 2022. Yeah, we did add two more counties, Loudoun and Fauquier, to our coverage area for our landowner services, uh, and to, we also were delighted to be able to add two full-time invasive management specialists. Uh, so these are the people who will go out and meet with you on your property in in the 12 county area, and one of them serves our northern counties, and the other one serves our southern counties, and these are you know, great great resources. Uh, that, that are proving to be very popular, no surprise. So but on, non, nonetheless, uh, if you're interested, let us know. And here we have, in terms of 2023, a couple of things to watch for. Uh, we've, we've begun planning a, a statewide workshop of, of many different conservation organizations to create statewide initiatives uh, to try and address various aspects of the invasive plant challenge. Stay tuned, more information on that should be coming in, in, in coming months. Uh, and there's, there's, there is some activity in the current legislative session that just started. Uh, and and uh, if, if we see that there are, are important bills that, that need support, uh, you may hear from us and, and with suggestions on, on what the bills are and how you might make a difference uh, by supporting them in the current legislative session. So just one, uh, one last slide on uh, just how we operate. Yeah, in terms of fundraising, this is a volunteer-driven, you know, no government funding of operations uh, type of, of, of nonprofit. Uh, we, we are funded by private donations and grants, including two grants that require us to raise a total of $40,000 in matching funds, uh, one from a family foundation and one from the Virginia Environmental Endowment. Uh, and every time we've gone out and asked you all to help us, uh, you know, you've you've come forth uh, and and, uh, and and enabled us to to meet the matches and and secure those grants, which has been terrific. 
Uh, we just finished one of those campaigns here in Q4, uh, which was a great success. And so a big thank you to all of you who, who contributed and helped out. It's, it, it really, it really, really makes a difference. So thank, thank you all. That's the, that's the end of what I've got. If you have any other questions about the PRISM, uh, feel free again to send a, a note off to info at blueridgeprism.org. Thank you all, uh, and thank you to our speakers. Uh, in, enjoy the session. All right. Thank you, Rod. And I think that we are ready to jump right in to. Yes. Podcast. Is that correct, Rowena? It is. And I just realized I was talking and I was on mute, but oh. <laughs> I, I was having a conversation with myself. But anyway, one thing I wanted to say before I, I switch to Beth is that there is going to be a survey that pops up at the end of this um, presentation. We hope you just take a moment to answer it. There's only around 11 questions and um, it would really help us so we know what to improve for next time. And the final thing is we know that a lot of you um, have donated to us to help make this program possible today. And we just want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts. But now I'd like to introduce um, Beth Mizell, who's the executive director of Blue Ridge Prism, and she's going to take it from here. Beth? Thank you, Rowena. I appreciate the lovely introduction. And thanks to Rod for the Prism update. Uh, lots of good things happening, and, and we're glad that you can be a part of it and uh, for your interest in this topic. So I am pleased to welcome our expert panelists today, Nicola, Laura, and Nicole, to discuss best winter practices for invasive plant control and to answer your many questions. Um, so before we begin, I am going to give the panelists uh, a few minutes to introduce themselves and uh, tell us a, a couple sentences about your background. And also, I want to know what your favorite plant uh, what is your favorite plant that you love to hate? So we'll start with Nicole. Uh, my favorite plant that I love to hate. Um, that is such a variable one, um, depending on time of year. Right now, <laughs> with all of the leaves off the trees, the English ivy that is climbing up so many of our really nice hardwoods is... Um, is really visible um, and so especially salient to me this time of year. So that's probably number one for me and especially because I happen to have a fair amount of it in my own backyard that um, has been under management for a couple of years now. Um, I'm sorry, did you also want me to say something about myself professionally or? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay. uh, so I'm Nicole Schumann. I am the Agriculture and Natural Resources Extension Agent in Goochland County. Uh, I've been in that role for um, probably about four years now. Uh, and, you know, in that role, I work with uh, master gardeners and I also work with um, farmers, homeowners, other kinds of landowners, especially in Goochland County, which is rapidly suburbanizing. We have um, plenty of people who move out to a couple of acres for the first time and end up um, uh, managing land in a way they haven't had to before. So I end up fielding a lot of those questions and having a lot of conversations with people about plant identification um, uh, and vegetation management. So. Thanks, Nicole. And Nicola. Hello. Um, so I've been trying to figure out what plants I love to hate. Um, I think I'm going to go with Japanese honeysuckle again, because mm. you can see it really clearly. This is a winter, winter based workshop. Um, but I actually I love the smell of the flowers. So I truly do. I love and I hate it because the smell, the flowers are beautiful. Um, but that vine is everywhere. It's all through my meadows. Um, it's not so much creeping up the trees on my land, but it's just everywhere in between all of my other actual favorite summer plants. So um, my name is Nicola McGough. I run a small consulting company called Wild Ginger Field Services. And we've been working in central Virginia for about the last 15 years or so. Um, specifically, we work on uh, native landscapes sort of stewardship and restoration. So some of that's invasive management, some is native planting uh, or monitoring or just helping uh, landowners formulate a plan, which can often be 
part of the main challenge is just trying to figure out what's your first step or what's your plan for the next five years. Um, and that's it, primarily just working in Central Virginia. Thanks, Nicole. And Laura. Uh, so yeah, my most favorite plant to hate, uh, like Nicole, varies by season and what I'm doing. I would have to say right now, winter creeper for its uh, just sheer tragic impact on uh, the park system. But also, I think if one really rose to the top, it would be Japanese knotweed uh, for so many reasons, uh, including just the physical <laughs> brutality. Um, of having to cope with it in peak summer. Um, but uh, so I am a uh, invasive plant management coordinator for the James River Park System here in the city of Richmond, Virginia. I've been in that role for about a year and a half, but eight years ago, I uh, was one of the founding members of the James River Park System Invasive Plant Task Force as a volunteer, as a member of the Riverine chapter of Virginia Master Naturalists, which is what brought me to um, my obsession with invasive plants uh, starting about 11, 12 years ago. Uh, so while I work in the city of Richmond, um, I do hail from the northern Blue Ridge, northern Piedmont, um, left that uh, area in 2007, but um, continue to battle invasives on the property I grew up on. So also very familiar with species um, more common in that, that region. All right. Thank you so much, Laura. And I, I will share my favorite plant that I love to hate. And I, even though this is not the best time to, or the time at all to deal with it is, uh, is Japanese stilt grass. And mostly because I've spent many, many hours climbing up and down steep slopes, spraying stilt grass and controlling stilt grass on nature preserves owned and managed by the Nature Conservancy. So I have a, a long history of, of blood, sweat, and tears over that particular plant. So, well, thank you so much for sharing uh, your backgrounds with us and, uh, and your plants. And um, I just I I just wanted to confirm that all three of you are certified pesticide applicators. Is that correct? Okay. So this is a great team of folks to to ask these questions to. Um, okay, so I'm going to, I'm getting distracted by the chat, so let me close that really quickly. And Rowena, can you go ahead and, and move to the next slide? So I just want to, before we really dig in, I just want to um, let you know that we we received all of your pre-submitted questions, and we had a lot of questions. And we have structured the program today to hopefully answer as many of those questions as we can within the time that we have allocated. Um, but please enter your questions into the Q&A and we'll leave some of those questions into the discussion as we can. And we also have some prison volunteers that are answering questions in the background so we can assist as many people as we can today. Um, and again, if, if we don't answer your question, send us an email, info at blueridgeprison.org. So we will get started. Um, we, so one question that we often get about winter control is shouldn't this happen during the growing season when sugars in the plants are above the ground? Um, and the answer is not necessarily. It can happen during the winter. So I wanted to start out with exploring some of the advantages of controlling invasive plants in the winter based on some of your experiences. And I think I would like to maybe start with Nicola on this question. And what are, what are cover some of the, the reasons why you might choose to control invasive plants during the winter? So there's a, there's a few reasons, but really the top one is that it's not so hot. Uh, <laughs> I'm from <laughs> Ireland, so the summer in Virginia is very hot to me, and I think very hot to most people if you're outside actually working in it. Um, so I think you get a better result as far as human effort when it's when you're not just you know falling over with the heat. Um, in the winter as well, there's a lot less vegetation. There's a lot less. There's you know a lot of the leaves are down already, so you have better access, especially in forested ecosystems. Um, to be able to actually see further and see where you're at. And then in meadow systems, you can see the ground, you know, where, like I said, I found like a lot of um, Japanese honeysuckle down on the ground. So I just think 
it's not necessarily better or worse. I just think it's a different time. It's definitely easier um, on your body to work in the winter. Mm -hmm. And it, it definitely lengthens that window of control or opportunities for control. Yeah, absolutely. And we've had good luck treating uh, woody species um, with like basil bark or hack and squirt methodologies, um, but also anything that retains green leaves in the winter. So anything that is evergreen, um, you can foliar spray in the winter, so long as it has leaves. Um, mm -hmm. You just have to expect them. The plants are half asleep, so you have to expect a much slower um, effect of the chemicals. So, you know, don't fret if you spray it and it's still green a week later, like in the summer, it may brown up very quickly in a day or two. But in the winter, it might take three or four weeks for a plant to show the effects of your work. So just be more patient in the winter. Yes, patience is key with this uh, timing during the winter and with managing invasive plants in general, patience and, and it's the long game. So one, one area that, um, that makes it more attractive is the lower risk of non-target damage. And we had one question specifically about ways to spare cool season seedlings of desirable species while removing dense growth of mustard, chickweeds, dead nettles. Um, any, any experience with that? And I thought, Laura, maybe you might have some experience really working in some urban systems with some of those, um, those species and how to avoid impacting those desirable natives. Sorry about that. I wasn't unmuted. Um, I think that given that we are what we are primarily uh, using chemical for during the winter is cut stem, uh, whether it's with free activity or with invasive shrub. So, Laura, your internet. Laura, we're having a hard time hearing you. I'm so sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah. I've got some an unstable internet. Is that better? Uh, yes, temporarily. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so if you're using cut stone chemical treatment for woody species, which is primarily what we're using chemical treatment for right now, by definition, you are um, uh, reducing collateral damage to deciduous species. I think, you know, if you're if you're doing a foliar spray application, then that's a different scenario and you have to simply avoid those species. I strictly in monoculture areas um, on woody species. So Laura, your internet is still being problematic and um, could, could you maybe turn your video off? And yeah, I just stopped the camera. Is that helpful? Yes, yeah. Oh, great. Okay. So okay. We, <laughs> we hate that we can't see you. So maybe you can- oh, That's all right. On. Um, that's okay. Whatever works. Uh, yeah. So this is probably the third the third attempt to answer this question, but um, uh, avoiding those sorts of um, species. Uh, what I was saying is that what we're doing in the park system, predominantly in the winter, is cut stem treatment of woody species, uh, such as uh, English ivy and winter creeper, with regard to free a tree um, or specific uh, shrub species. And when you're doing cut stem treatment, that is a the most targeted treatment that you could be using. So you're, you're mitigating collateral damage um, by focusing on that activity. And um, otherwise, I would defer to Nicole or uh, Nicola, but um, you know, if you're, if you're in a situation where you're perhaps doing a foliar treatment of um, evergreen invasive vines, then you're hopefully you know, working in a monoculture area um, where anything desirable is dormant. I guess, Beth, I, I can chime in here because I think, mm -hmm. you know, in a lot of times we're talking about um, sort of herbaceous and low growing plants that might be mixed in with other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and while certainly I can, I can think of uh, desirable species maybe in my lawn that are going to be cool season species, 
a lot of herbaceous natives tend to be warm season species in Virginia. I'm not saying that there aren't going to be cool season species out there that you might want to um, preserve, but a lot of that growth is going to be warm season. So um, you are avoiding the majority of the potential damage to native herbaceous species. And the other thing that I'll say about herbaceous species, something that maybe changes the cost benefit analysis than, um, than if we were to deal with like a woody species or a tree, is that they tend to come back pretty quickly, right? You know, if it's an annual, they just have that one year life cycle anyways. If it's a perennial, um, you know, Obviously, they can live for multiple years, but they can still be established from seed if it's an herbaceous species. If it's something woody, a native tree or a native shrub, those can take many years to establish themselves and to grow. And so we really definitely want to avoid damage to those. Um, but I, I do think that um, depending on the extent of the invasive species problem, there does have to be that um, cost benefit analysis of any potential damage to um to native species as well. Um, I hope that I hope that makes sense. I'm sure Nicola has something else to say. The other thing that I'll say is that for those um uh depending on the extent of the issue again, manual removal is also a possibility. And uh, especially when the soil is moist, as long as you're in an area that isn't especially prone to erosion or something like that, you can go through and and hand weed. Um, I do a lot of hand weeding of Creeping Charlie this time of year in my garden. Um, I'm, I'm sure other people are in the same boat there. But Nicola, anything I missed, or if you disagree with me, please. Yeah. No, I think it's great. I was just going to say that like, Sometimes I can envision a space where you have some native plants that you do want to keep or even uh, landscaped plants. Maybe they're not native, but you still want to keep them. Right. And then you have um, the side effects of treatment. But you can just like you don't have to hand weed the whole bed, but maybe you can make yourself a little space from the thing you're trying to save. You know, just even six inches, something so as if you're spraying, you're not right up against something you consider valuable. Um, but I think hand weeding is great. And if you you know, have kids that need something to do or grandkids, it's great to show them one plant and, you know, you can make up all kinds of stories and just have them yank it out. And they usually, they'll go to town for probably about half an hour, so. Great, okay, thank you. Uh, that was wonderful. And so we touched on a few preferred targets, but I just want to kind of cover what are some preferred targets of invasive plants for winter control. And, and Rowena, can you advance uh, a couple of slides um, that highlight some of these? But um, Nicole, what are, what are some of the species that you go after during the winter? Or you're talking to making recommendations to control in the winter to landowners you visit with? Um, definitely things like uh, multiflora rose and privet are really big targets this time of year. Um, uh, and I, I feel like the slides are saying it all here. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, so um, a lot of our vines, uh, especially honeysuckle, can be really visible because it tends to retain its leaves, as does uh, winter creeper and English ivy as well. So um, those are also really great targets. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of pretty much most of your woody species are going to be things that you want to think about. Yeah, yeah. And and we had mentioned the the things that are easy to spot, those evergreen species, prime, prime targets. But um, just I, I'll also say that, you know, as you work on plant identification, I'm sure we have a variety of level of skills in terms of plant ID on the call today. Um, but the even if a plant doesn't have its leaves, learning those other very visible tells, a lot of them, um, you know, have fruit this time of year, they'll retain their fruit for the winter. And certainly the fruit on oriental bittersweet is extremely distinctive uh, and can really help with identification. Mm -hmm. um, so leaves are leaves are like your go-to, but there are also you know other things that hang out on the plant that can be really helpful. Yeah, and Nicola, did you have a follow-up to that? Yeah, I think um, it can be a little daunting sometimes when you walk into the woods and and you're starting with bark ID. Um, like it's easier if you already have your leaf ID and you have some idea what's out there, but let, you know if you just sort of walked out today with with no basis, it can definitely be a bit of a challenge. 
Um, but I would always, my, my land is full of bits of flagging tape and little pin flags and notes to myself because um, I don't remember stuff from month to month, you know, potentially from day to day, depending on how busy I am. Mm -hmm. So if there's a tree and you're unsure of the ID, you can always just hang some flagging tape on it, write yourself a little note and wait till it leaves out, you know, and then treat it next winter. Or you can just sort of start working like that, making your own observation or your own little database of knowledge off your land. Yes. And this is also a great time of year to scout for, if, you know, if, if you don't know something, um, you can, or if you are more familiar with plant ID, this is a great time to be out just scouting for stuff that you know, and making those notes and, and starting to make a plan. And some things are very are highly visible this time of year. And some things you need to scout during the summer, it's going to be easier to find. So it really depends on the, the plant. Um, um, I don't yeah. think we mentioned, did, did we mention, did, did we mention garlic mustard? Uh, as I, don't, I don't think we have mentioned garlic mustard. Yeah, as a, as a manual removal, which, uh, you know, right now I can't say that I'm making it like the top species priority, but it's something that you can just integrate into the other things you're doing, you know, so we're doing in certain um, constrained small scope uh, restoration areas where there's just been years of ongoing manual removal of winter creeper and English ivy ground cover. It's like when you come across the garlic mustard, you get that too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, a, it's a time, garlic mustard, you can hand pull, which is right. simple when the soil's moist, but you can also do foliar application of herbicide if you have a lot to do and, yeah. and manual control is not a feasible option. Um, and, and we'll talk more about that later in the program. Uh, what are what are some species that are not good targets in the winter? Because uh, we, we do have a, questions about Japanese silkgrass and we've had questions about Phrygmites, um, other grasses, Japanese knotweed, um, any other species that come to mind that aren't the best targets this time of year? Hops. I think somebody asked questions about, I think you might have already said that, but there were questions about Japanese hops, which is not active. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, and kudzu, what, what can we do about kudzu during the winter months? There's some limited options there. Yeah. In, in the winter, it's a great time. Kudzu is incredibly robust. And so in the summer, it's, it's almost untouchable because it's just makes large curtains, you know, up 20 feet, 30 feet tall. So in the winter, it's a great time to kind of gain some ground on it and bring it down to knee high, you know, or below your knee for when it comes up um, in the springtime. So you can cut the vines if they're hanging from the trees, I would cut them at about six feet tall and at the ground. So like this double cut, I think some people call it a window cut. Um, I would do that with almost all vines, but it just allows a human to walk underneath and you don't have to address what's hanging above your head. Uh, just a side note, not to pull any vines that are overhead because um, they've often killed tree branches. So you could really um, get a big smack on the head from something pulling it down. Um, but kudzu, you can like that, you can make a window cut and get, you know, in through it. Or if it's coming across the ground, you can even run a lawnmower or a weed whacker into it and just push it back. So when it's growing in the spring and summer, you have some a, an easier starting point. So, but spray won't work on kudzu in the winter. I don't think it's no. effective. No. And do any of you have experience with grubbing out kudzu, the, the root crowns? Any experience? Um, I, I have not tackled that, but um, Nicola, what about uh, in terms, I realize that, that anything foliar, whether it's grazing, cutting, or foliar treatment with kudzu has to be done during repeatedly in the growing season, but can you, uh treat the crowns or do the the separation there's a there's also that that non-treatment option right of separating the tuber from the crown i, I was love to hear some detail on that well i, I am not going to be able to provide any detail on that i'm afraid Laura, but it sounds it's very interesting so i'll look it up um i think you can apply herbicide to the crown or to a cut um like a cut stump of right. these larger vines. Um, I just don't know that it's effective on kudzu. It may be. So if anybody else knows that, please chime in. Um, I know I've tried it on Japanese honeysuckle and had very uh, low, um, a low response rate on that in the winter. 
It does better with foliar or even a prescribed burn on uh, Japanese honeysuckle will take it back to the crown. It doesn't eliminate it, but it, it really knocks it back. Um, so I think, yes, you know, spraying is one option that you could try, but also just cutting it low, getting, you know, getting some control over it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, reducing okay. that surface okay. area. Okay. Be, oh, Jim, this, please, this is for the panelists, please. Um, um, so I, yeah, to reducing that surface area is really important for approaching a lot of these in, invasive plants. And um, Beth, if I could just tack yeah. on one last thought, which is um, cutting those plants low in the winter. If you are going to be doing a foliar spray, it makes the foliar spray much safer, as well as generally reduces the volume that you have to do in, in the growing season. Because rather than having plants that are possibly above your head, where you know you now have to worry about protecting yourself from overhead spray, you're spraying down at knee or boot level. Um, and so it's, it's, it's much safer to, to cut it all back, let it re-sprout. Um, the same is true for bamboo. I know we had a lot of questions about bamboo. We had a lot of questions about bamboo. Yes. Okay. So let's let's move on. And well, but one point before we we do move on is is a, a little bit of discussion about how plant phenology really plays into the timing of control. And I know this is a this is something that each of you on the panel wanted to to point out to the audience. So, um, any initial thoughts on that you want to share about plant phenology and planning for? Uh, control options. Um, I can take a first shot if you'd like. Okay. Um, so we'll just start with sort of planning. So a bit like higher, higher level thinking is um, just making the short list or the long list of the species you have, right? Every piece of land I've been on in Virginia has some invasive species. They're not all desperately in need of treatment, but it's still good to know what you have. So it gives you a chance to work on your ID, make sure it's correct and start having in mind like whereabouts it is on your land and if you know the species name then um, there's a lot of information out there on like department of natural heritage has invasive species fact sheet i know blue ridge prism has a lot of information so just try and get to know maybe the species at the top of your list or the one that's most um, widespread on your land like you have to start somewhere so just you have to become like an educated advocate so a semi-ecologist on this this one plant or these five plants and understand if they're summer growing or spring or winter or you know, when they set seeds, do they like it wet or dry or shady? And you just, um, for me, I always think of plants as like a, um, having a personality and it's much easier then for me to remember uh, the personality of the plant, you know, so this one like doesn't care, it will take anything, you know, or whatever. And so it's just, that's my little cue for being able to understand the plants. And then you have to just, that is your system that you're working in. So if it doesn't like shade, maybe you can plant trees as a longer strategy. You can be treating it and creating shade. Um, if it likes it wet, maybe there's a way to dry that little place out because maybe you're putting your downspout there and you can, you know, redirect that. Or some, just some micro changes that you can make um, to the ecosystem, in fact, to even discourage the plant from staying there. Um, but I would say like, first, just get to know your cast of characters and they themselves will tell you a lot of when and how you can um, kind of approach treating them or, or managing them, right? Trying to keep them to a minimum. Yeah, yeah. The um, I mean, Nicola's already covered this probably about as in depth as it needs to, but just um, really knowing the life cycle of the plant. Is it an annual or a perennial? And is it a warm season or a cool season plant? Um, you know, what we're not going to be talking about a lot uh, in, in this webinar today are our warm season herbaceous plants because they're just not going to be controlled by anything in the winter. Their life cycle doesn't really allow for that opportunity. But we will be talking about those cool season herbaceous plants, like the ones we have on the, the slide right now, um, and our woody perennial species. So, um, just knowing, just knowing just some basic words, is this an annual or a perennial? Is it a warm season or a cool season? Um, can really help you to start, um, yeah, just building that calendar, you know, whether it's written down or in your head, building that calendar. 
Mm -hmm. And I would just add that bearing in mind that, yes, the biology and life cycle of the plant is is sort of first in line when you're uh, in, in terms of making treatment decisions and scheduling and planning. But there are also going to be variations based on where you are. You know, I'm, I'm in Richmond. It's going to be a pretty different than, you know, Albemarle County or points northwest. Um, and then there can just be site variation as well. Uh, and I think, I know we're not talking about stilt grass, but like that's a classic, you know, example of doing the wrong thing at the wrong time can do a lot of damage. So if you're, if you do the, the, you know, or even, you know, just your timing, timing is everything and, um, and you can actually do more harm than good if, if you make, you know, an error, but where you are, your climate, your conditions, site conditions, you know, the, the, the light regimen, the moisture, all these things can play into differences. Um, so if you're reading a guidance document, say from Penn State, um, but you're in Richmond, they, those things might not line up perfectly. And, you know, for instance, there's a pic the picture of Ficaria verna, lesser celandine on the, on the screen right now. That pops up here. We've observed that as early as mid-December. You know, whereas usually it's described as something that emerges in late winter. So, you know, there are these unique characteristics. Yeah, and I worked on a project, um, and not weed project specifically, Wilt Laura actually in Richmond. And the guidance we had was from um, Pennsylvania that had been redirected to us by um, Virginia Department of Natural Heritage. So, you know, we, I felt very confident that we had the right information. And even with that, um, Laura and her team were going out every week or two to make measurements of this regrowth pattern because we weren't sure with just that difference in geography, if it really was like a mid August that we were gonna go back out and treat or is it the start of August or the end of August? You know, so just this nuance that was just unknown in Virginia. And so it just takes um, a kind of a diligence in observation and a patience, like you said at the start. So now, like I'm, I have a better understanding of the timing of knotweed um, in Central Virginia. That's all really good information. And I just want to point out a, an updated version of the Plant Invaders of Mid-Atlantic Natural Areas is available, and this is available online as a download. But it has a lot of the great information about the plant, its habits, phenology. Um, and some control guidance in there. But this is a really great document to help you learn um, all of those things that you might need to take into consideration, just like we were talking about here um, for invasive plant management. Oh, so sorry, the book um, is called Plant Invaders of Mid-Atlantic Natural Areas. It is by Jill Swearingen and Judith Fulton. So if you do a Google search for plant invaders of mid-Atlantic, you should pop up. Okay, so let's, uh, let's move on. This has been a really wonderful discussion. Thank you so much. And lots of, lots of great questions from the audience. And uh, there's a lot to, to process <laughs> in, our, in the chat, in the Q&A, and what's been submitted already. So just want to, we've touched on a lot of this information already, but just want to look over some manual and mechanical methods of, uh, of invasive plant management. So we've talked about hand pulling um, and good candidates for hand pulling. Um, we talked about cutting, and then you could do a cut and paint with herbicide, and then grubbing. Uh, this uh, this uh, graphic that you see is uh, an example of, of how you would grub a kudzu. Um, that, that we were just talking about. And unfortunately, none of us have a lot of experience with that particular um, technique. Um, so uh, Rowena, can you please go to the next slide? And so I just wanted, before we really start to talk about vines and shrubs in particular, we do have, have a lot of questions about, about vines and shrubs. Just wanna take a moment. We're gonna be talking about herbicides during, and in addition to manical, manual and mechanical methodologies, we are gonna be talking about herbicides. And I just wanted to give an opportunity for Nicole to share some information about the legal aspects of herbicide use while this herbicide safety slide is up. So Nicole, a few words about that. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess, first of all, because I have seen some questions in the chat about a family member or a neighbor's property or volunteers applying in Virginia, if you do not have a license, it is only legal to apply pesticides, which include herbicides, insecticides, rodenticides. It is only legal to apply pesticides to your own property. Um, so that's that's something that you really need to keep in mind. Um, without a license, you can purchase any pesticide that is not restricted use. And like I said, use it on your own property. You would need an applicator's license in order to apply on property that is not your own. This also means that if you are contracting with someone to come in and do invasive species management, and if that management will include pesticide use, you need to make sure that they're properly certified. Um, Certainly, there have been plenty of lawn care companies that have gotten in trouble with the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services because one of their clients asked them to spray a little bit of Roundup, spray a little bit of weed killer, and now they're applying uh, pesticides without a license. So there are licensing requirements there. Um, uh, additionally, I will say that um, the label is regardless of whatever we tell you about chemicals you need to read the label yourself because the label is actually a legal agreement between the Environmental Protect Protection Agency, the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, and you, the end user. So it is a legal document. You need to read and follow all of the information on that document. And that will include things about what plants you can spray it on uh, and what site and where, what sites you can apply that pesticide to. Um, sometimes the language, the label language is very, very specific. And it says, you know, this can only be applied to such and such site. Other times it's much broader and it might say, you know, woody weedy species. Um, and it might be very broad in terms of the site you can apply. But it is important to, to read that, to know not just where that chemical is safe to apply, um, but also how to keep yourself safe in terms of the personal protective equipment you put on, um, how you need to uh, mix that that uh, pesticide, how you need to um, dispose of it, those sorts of things. Um, that's that's all going to be contained on the label for the most part. So it's, it's really important to read the label very, very carefully. Um, the other thing that we that I run into a lot when dealing with this stuff is there are multiple names for uh, pesticides. There is the trade name, so that's whatever it's sold under. So that would be something like Roundup. Um, there is the uh, uh, chemical name, which is typically something like very long and scientific. And then there's just the like active ingredient name, which is we, I tend to use more, which are things like triclopyr and glyphosate. So a lot of times recommendations will come for a specific active ingredient and not necessarily for a specific trade name. So one active ingredient can be sold under a variety of different trade names. So you just need to read that label very carefully and know that you have the correct active ingredients. And then also read that label to make sure that you're applying that active ingredient in a way that's um, consistent with that label. Did that cover it, Beth? Uh, Nicole, yes, I, think you so. on mute. I don't know if you have something else to add yeah, there. We, we do have a, a quick question. Yeah. A pesticide versus herbicide. Can you give us a brief? So pesticide is a blanket statement that covers any chemical that is applied to kill a living organism. Herbicide specifically refers to a pesticide that is applied to plants. So a fungicide is applied to fungi, an insecticide is applied to insects, a rodenticide is applied to rodents. Um, so that's that's something important to note as well, because you know, herbicides are formulated specifically for plants. Um, so they're not going to have the same effect on insects necessarily that an in insecticide would. So uh, yeah, there are some important distinctions there. I tend to use the word pesticide very, very broadly, but obviously when we're talking about plants, we're talking about herbicides. All right, thanks for that point of clarification. So uh, Rowena, can you please scroll to the next slide? And speaking of the slides, we've had several questions about if these slides will be available after, the, after this uh, webinar, and yes, they will. 
Everyone who is registered today will receive an email later today with links to information, including this slideshow um, and also the recording and the Q&A. So uh, watch your inboxes for an email from us through MailChimp for that information. All right, so let's um, talk a little bit more about um, working with herbicides in, in the colder climates. Um, so we had a question and they said, when I think of invasive control, I think of using herbicides for the most part, which are not effective in cold climates. So I wanna talk a little bit about this misconception that people have about using herbicides in cooler temperatures. And we touched on one point earlier is to be patient because the herbicides works more slowly. Um, so we had, and we also had some spe specific questions about the, the methods and, and one was specifically, is cut stump control using glyphosate effective during the winter? And uh, Laura, would you like to, to answer that briefly? Uh, yes, uh, so it, it certainly can be, and it might depend on the species and it might depend on um, what time even in the winter are you talking about late um, December, are you talking about February? I mean, my, I have, I can't say that we have done research on that. I've seen some, you know, sort of anecdotal um, observations of mine that I think, mm, I don't know, I think that was less effective at uh, killing uh, um, your honeysuckle in February, um, for instance. But I can tell you that, yes, it's uh, particularly if you are, winter is prime time for doing what we call free a tree, uh, which is our little um, non-patented name for uh, addressing winter creeper and English ivy that's uh, overwhelming our mature tree canopy. And if you don't treat those larger vines, they will regenerate growth uh, you know, immediately, uh, you know, it's just in order to truly be effective, you have to treat those stumps of the large vines and, you know, anything that you can't, you can't uproot from the ground um, is going to have to be treated. And yes, it's definitely um, effective at getting the root system of those plants. And then we're also using it on particularly Chinese privet, uh, right now, which is a dominant invasive shrub in the park system. And I guess you'd call that semi-evergreen, perhaps. Um, and uh, thorny olive, I, autumn olive comes up a lot, I know, because of its presence, um, you know, particularly in the in the Piedmont, uh, in the Blue Ridge. Um, but we have a lot of thorny olive, um, which we also treat with a cut stem, you know, as well as that Amir honeysuckle. So... It may be that its peak effectiveness is when those plants are preparing for dormancy, you know, in the very late summer, the fall, here, you know, into December, which of course can be so very mild, but uh, it's definitely appropriate uh, throughout the winter months on those activities. Yeah, and Beth, I'll say that, um, you know, we, we have ideal times for treating like that woody species with cut stump or hack and squirt or, um, basil bark treatment, right? That's all applying uh, some type of herbicide to a woody vine species, either one. Um, but I think if for some reason in your human world, you only have time in May to, to do this work, you know, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. It just won't be as effective. There's not, but there's no rule where you cannot do it in May. You just maybe should lower your expectation of the outcome, but you still will have an effect, you know, and some kind of mortality on the trees and vines. So just to, to give that, because I know some people like maybe they go to, I don't know if they're lucky, they go to Florida for the winter or something, and then they come back and they're trying to do their land stewardship. Um, you know, I think it's available to you year round. Um, obviously there are better times. And then we have used glyphosate on all kinds of woody and vine species. And like Laura said, highly effective. Um, and then on some of the largest ailanthus trees where we were doing um, hack and squirt or basil bark, it wasn't as effective. So if they were just very big diameter ailanthus, that's a very strong organism. So we would either know that we would be back to treat it a couple of times, which is, that's fine. You know, in my world, that was fine to retreat, or we would switch to triclopure. Um, but triclopure is a much stronger chemical. And so 
I'm not, you know, it depends on your comfort level with the chemicals, what you want to use. Um, but triclopyr is, you know, generally more effective than glyphosate on woody species, but you don't necessarily have to use it. Yeah, and, I, and we didn't mention concentrations, but I can tell, say that our sort of standard, and I, this, I, you know, for again, we're talking about these woody vine and shrub species, what I've focused on is a 50% of, uh, and, and the two products, and we don't always want to use trade names, but Vaseline is a triclopyr amine active ingredient. Roundup Custom is a, uh, uh, a glyphosate uh, product. We, they're both water soluble. So we're using a concentration of 50% um, of those products most of the time for that ideal treatment range um, with that cut stem treatment, as well as hack and squirt, which is we're typically doing in the fall during that dormancy prep period. And then Laura, sometimes I've had people get very confused, me being one of them. Um, when you say 50% concentration, is it can get product. confusing where, yeah, when the bottle contains right. like, like here, 41% glyphosate right. concentrate. So you mean like kind of, one part water, one part product is the correct like dilution you're talking about. Just to, I don't know, yeah. I found that very confusing the first few years I was at this, and I used to keep reading it's, the label to make sure I was doing the right dilution. And, yeah, and it's so. confusing for everybody, and different and guidance documents can be really confusing because they don't necessarily yeah. specify that they're talking about the product or the active ingredient. But as Nicola was pointing out, like custom Roundup or Rodeo, those are two different glyphosate products. They're about 54% active ingredient. The Vaseline is about 55%, you know, active ingredient. But then we're that product, we're taking that product and diluting it 50% water, 50% product. In a typically we're using a dauber that's holds up four ounces and has a sponge tip on it. And adding a marker dye, which you, you know, maybe don't need to do if you're just working on your own property. That's a really good thing to, to point out because we do get a lot of questions about active ingredient versus the product and that, that is a point of confusion that is not always clear in the guidance and even some of the guidance that, that Ozone has, is using. So we try to make sure to clarify that. So thank you, Nicola and Laura for, for bringing that up and, and exploring that topic more. Uh, since we're talking about shrubs, I, I think we should we should continue on that track a little bit more. And Robina, can you uh, scroll to the shrub slide, and then we'll come back to there. We go. So we have the autumnal, which is kind of representative of of the different methodologies to to control shrubs. Um, so Laura, you mentioned the thorny olive being. Uh, being predominant in, in your area. And, and I do see that as often planted and those are treated the same way as autumn olive, correct? Okay. Um, so let's cover some of the best control techniques for autumn olive and Chinese privet in the winter months. And I think we've touched on a lot of these already. Um, so I'll just ask some of the specific questions that, that we, we pointed at that, that we were asked. Um, so one was, is it better to use cut stump or basil bark to keep the structure for wildlife until the native plants regrow? So should you cut stump and remove all the plant material or should you basil bark and leave the plant structure in place? What, are, what might be the reason to do both methodologies and, and, and is it, which, which one is better? you think in your experience or does it depend everything depends yeah <laughs> um i think yeah i think you can do either so you know kind of whatever is your personal preference um mm -hmm. if i was working i find cut stump um, physically difficult just cutting the trees and then also treating with herbicide in very kind of quick succession you can't leave the stump sitting there so i always preferred basil bark treatment um because then I can just sort of, you know, I'm walking around as opposed to cutting and treating. Um, I think leaving standing dead is always great for wildlife and birds, um, but it might be an eyesore. Um, 
Then I've worked on other properties where that I, I saw was kind of like a pat on the back because you can see all the things you killed. And so it was making people very happy. Uh, so it really depends on like the, the site and the visual specifics. Um, if you take them down and put them on the ground, brush piles also form great habitat features. So I don't think you can, there's no wrong way to treat um, shrubby stuff. That's my answer on that. Yeah, I would, I, just to follow up on that, I would say um, that cut stump is definitely a two person job. You know, one person is cutting and then the other person is applying herbicide. Um, and I would also say that, you know, the decision might depend on how much access you need to get to that site later. Um, it, it just depends on what the long-term management plan is is for the site. Yeah, and then I was going to add, we, we basil bark is something we're really pretty new to here. We just kind of initiated that recently because, you know, it does, for one thing, require a, a different product. It's a, um, an ester formulation of triclopyr in a, you know, in an oil carrier. But one of the things that we didn't kind of anticipate is that we were trying to work in an area that is very, very dense privet. And not only is the thickets, the thickets themselves are very, very dense, but then they are buried under dense English ivy, meaning that the base of that trunk is not exposed. And I was joking to my coworker that when you see demonstration photos of basil bark, it always seems like there's this nice open clearing and there's just this sort of single trunk um, there. And we, and we you know, realized that the area we were trying to do it in was just not site appropriate. And so, you know, that's a factor. And then I think, I don't know that we, if we mentioned that basil bark is specific to thin bark, thin, smooth bark, species, um, you know, of a particular size. So, you know, autumn or, um, well, I, my mind just always goes to bush honeysuckle. So I, I don't think we're talking about that, uh, but not, not suitable for a basil bark because of the nature of the bark of that species. Okay. So let's um, take, let, let's take a couple steps back because I'm seeing a lot of questions about, well, what is basil bark? Yep. And um, so in, in this particular side slide, you see in the central photo, there is a group, a trunk, and it has a, a red, uh, red color to it. That is the, the herbicide, so triclopyr ester, mixed with a basil oil that has a dye in it. So this is an example of a basil bark application. Um, yes, it's red like the autumnal that we see on the screen. It also can be blue. It just depends on the color of the dye. Rowena, can you go to the basil bark slide quickly? We do, so here's a basil, a, a better example of, uh, so we have a photo of a fellow that is spraying, uh, doing a basil bark application on a small tree here and some of the products that you might use. So we've, uh, so basil bark would be used on some invasive shrubs as we, uh, the panelists have just discussed, or you could use it on smaller invasive trees that are about six to eight inches in diameter. Um, so it really depends on your, your site, what, what is available to you, and the density, as Laura pointed out, the density of the infestation. Rowena, yeah. can, will you please scroll to the cut stump slide? Okay. And so we've, we've mentioned cut stump uh, a lot during this presentation. And you may also notice cut and paint. So you can, um, so either you can just cut a vine and keep cutting it and cutting it and handful, or you can mix it with herbicide. So you would cut and then apply herbicide quickly to the surface, as you can see in the photos here. So on larger stems, you would apply the herbicide to the exterior of the stump. So hitting that cambium layer, so the herbicide is taken down into the roots of the, the shrub or the tree. And then we also have an example here with a vine using cut stump. So this is, I, I think this was a winter creeper vine that was attached to a native tree. And uh, so they cut out a little slice of a window and applied herbicide to the lower portion. You don't have to apply herbicide to the upper portion of the vine because that's gonna die. It's been cut off from its root system and that, that is going to die. And I think uh, Nicola talked a little bit about that earlier in the program. 
So last question about uh, basal bar is the difference between triclopyr amine and triclopyr ester. And I'm going to uh, throw this to Nicola just because you had a wonderful answer last year and about this, if you, I don't know if you even recall. Yes, I do remember, <laughs> Samantha. I was sitting here trying to Google, but my internet is not fast enough. <laughs> I was trying to Google which one is which. So one of the triclopures is um, safe for use in aquatic environments. So that looks like maybe the amine one. And the other one is not to be used near water or in any place with standing water, wetland or stream or lake. Um, so that is a very big difference in the reason why you would choose one versus the other. Um, both of them are very strong chemicals and can be used on uh, broad leaf. They're not for grasses. So they're for use on like trees and vines and shrubs, things like that. They should not have an effect on grasses. Hopefully I got that right. Um, but then I will also say the aquatic safe one, um, the amine formula um, carries a little bit higher of a, a personal protective equipment need. Um, and it can do pretty serious damage to human eyeballs if you um, get a splash. Um, it's not really damage that you can wash back out of your eye. I'm not at all trying to be glib about this. So that product has always made me a little nervous because you can be very careful and you should be very careful and have eye protection, um, but splashes happen um, just naturally when you're spraying or applying a liquid. And so just to put some large caution on using tricopyr amine um, uh, in, in any kind of uh, slapdash fashion, it's, it's a very serious chemical for, for a human to interact with. Yes, and so, always use that personal protective equipment, eye yeah. protection and gloves. Oh, and Beth, if I could just tack something yeah. onto that. I, I believe the ester formulation is more volatile than the mm -hmm. amine formulation, yeah. mm -hmm. um, which is one of the ways that it can actually like do a great job penetrating that bark, right? It, it, it tends to be just mobile in ways that the amine formulation is not. But that does mean that I believe there are some um, sort of like temperature or climactic restrictions on the label. So th the label can even include language about, um, yeah, what the weather is supposed to be on, on the day that you're applying. And it's very important to, to take those seriously. Um, I did see a question in the Q&A about whether this was geared more towards professionals or like gardeners and homeowners. And I just wanted to take a moment to also say that the chemicals and the techniques that we're talking about today are things that homeowners can absolutely do. Um, it does require a little bit of education uh, and it requires some precautions be taken, but um, I don't want anyone to feel discouraged because we're, you know, we, we are professionals and we're talking about this maybe, you know, and using fancy words. I just wanted to throw that out there, Beth. Yeah. No, absolutely. And I'm glad that, that you brought the attention to that because sometimes this work can be a little intimidating or overwhelming. And, and I hope that, that by being here, we, we take some of the, that intimidation out by answering your questions or giving you information to learn more. And, and also keep in mind that there are a lot of manual techniques that you can use. It, it may require more effort and more diligence, um, but you can do that and you can minimize the use of herbicides. And that's what we all want is less herbicides in the environment to do this work. So we are at 1242 and uh, we are just scratching the surface. I think we've touched on a lot of things, but I'd like to spend a few minutes talking more about vines, because we did have a lot of questions about vines. And uh, so Rowena, can, will you scroll back to the evergreen right? There we go. So let's talk a little bit about managing invasive vines. And, and Laura, you, you talked about your free tree. Mm -hmm. um, and <coughs> excuse me. And we talked about prioritizing aerial vines and clearing vines away from the base of the tree. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm so sorry. Can you talk about some of the methodologies to remove vines away from the base of the tree? Sure. The tree? Yeah, and you're like, the, the, the picture there, that tree is definitely heavily impacted by English ivy, but the, the ground around it is looks the way it should look, right? But in the James River Park system, 
English ivy and winter creeper are dominant invasive vines, and much of the park system is, you know, I would 50% cover or above with invasive vine ground cover, if not 75% to 100% in many areas. So, um, you know, one of our management priorities in the park system is is preserving our mature tree canopy, which means freeing trees. But it's very uh labor intensive it's time and labor intensive we're doing and we're doing this is work we do with volunteers i mean we're doing the the, the trading part um so you want to make it count you don't want that to be a wasted effort where it's going to have to be repeated all too soon um so we always we always take it in steps when you're training volunteers you're first you're clear you know you're sort of getting your debris away from the base of the tree so you can see what you're dealing with you're using hand printers to cut all the small vines you're stepping up to loppers and hand saws to carefully cut the big vines without damaging the tree but the last step and the step that volunteers often have a tendency to skimp on is creating a buffer zone around that tree because if you're surrounded by invasive ground cover um, or you're leaving something behind, that growth is going to sh go right back for that tree. So uh, my coworker, Gary Williams, calls them uh, lifesavers, you know, because it's a ring around a tree. It's a lifesaver for the tree. But to the best of your ability, getting about a two foot buffer zone around that tree where you are, uh, again, also also hopefully not damaging native vines, and which is that's a lot of delicate ID can you know that can get tricky. Um, not so much in the winter, but um, yeah, just clearing a nice big base around that tree. And then if you're talking about your own property, you're not talking about a 600 acre park system, you know, monitor, I mean, we're monitoring as well. But if you have trees in your yard that you're doing this, just be aware you're going to have to do follow up. So um you're going to, you know, go back to that tree and check for regrowth and, you know, continue to pull out new sprouts, um, cut things again that need cutting. Um, but it is a multi-step process and you, you've got to create that buffer for that tree. And we have a question from Laurel and asking, is there a maximum time window between when you can cut and when you can treat the vines? And I guess this would be with, with any woody species, but. I'm glad I meant to, I made a mental note to say something about that, but just as fast as possible, <laughs> you know, hopefully yeah. almost immediately because yes, it will start to seal up. And I often think when I'm looking at past work, I'm like, well, what factors played into that not having knocked out that shrub. And I think, well, you know, one thing may have been that it didn't get treated quickly enough. So I, I've i seen, I think the only thing I ever found in the literature was like under a minute. I don't know what Nicole and Nicola say to that. Uh, that's, you know, and that and that is, is tricky if you've got one person doing cutting and, you know, or volunteers doing cutting and one person who's a, a licensed applicator, you've got to move fast. Yeah, and I will say specifically for English ivy, I've worked at some places where we did cut and we treated the bottom section that was cut and the top stayed alive for months and months and months and months, much to my client's dismay. Um, and it was very hard for me to explain it to them because it's like, well, it's not attached to the ground anymore. I don't know why it's still alive, you know, but ivy is just a very uh, tenacious plant so it'll stay up there for a while so just don't lose don't lose hope if you if you're treating the bottom and it's attachment to all the nutrients and water and life then you know hopefully the top dies eventually but it can stick around green for quite a while ivy specifically most of the other ones they're done within like a week or so they start withering and looking kind of puny but ivy yeah it's a strange plant it's a, it has a lot of energy you know, it does and it's <laughs> Tissues. Um, so we also had some questions about herbicide movement and, and you know possible impacts to other plants that might be nearby. And um, so I was thinking of you know if you're applying herbicide to a cut stump of an English ivy, is that will will that impact the tree that's next to it? Is there is there a risk there? We've had several questions about that. Who wants to answer? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think we probably so, have the same answer, which is no. It it really it sh it should not. You're you're not you're not applying. It, it, there's no runoff. 
Um, so these are products that have low soil activity. They break down extremely quickly in the soil. But if you're applying to a cut stem, if you've seen and those pictures showed it with the marker dye, you're only applying that product to the stem of the plant that's going to take it into its root system. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, that I, that I will add yeah. that it, it does vary a little bit chemical by chemical. Someone yeah, specifically does. had a question about a chemical. The trade name was Spike, and I, I wasn't familiar with it. I looked it up. I read through the label, and there were a lot of warnings on there about damage to off-target woody species. Um, so... Yeah, generally speaking, um, I know someone put a link in the chat um, earlier about um, off-target damage with amazapir, but generally speaking, the glyphosate, the triglopyr, um, these these are going to be safe to use in these applications. Nicole, yeah. what is, is amazapir the active ingredient of spike? Spike is no, it's um, to tebuteron or something like that. Um, yeah, I'm not familiar with it. It's it's. It, I don't think it's a restricted use, but it is, it's just not one that we're typically right. using in these situations. Yeah. And I think for myself personally, I, um, I started getting very concerned when I would read all the different types of products that were out there, even if some of the chemistry kind of overlaps. Um, it made me feel uneasy because I couldn't quite understand it, or I didn't have enough experience with, let's say, Spike or, or Amazipure. So to begin with, I just used one, one type of glyphosate, you know, until I felt comfortable that I understood how it worked. I read everything I could. I tried it on some plants and sort of just moved along like that. Glyphosate can do almost everything you need um, in your home landscape or even in the park landscape, right? Mm -hmm. Triclopure does some overlap with that and is slightly stronger, but most of our work, I think, can be accomplished with glyphosate. And so like that, if, if some of this conversation is making you nervous and you're like, what if it kills my beautiful oak tree or, uh, you know, or my dog or, you know, any other concern that um, it's nice if you can just maybe start with one, one thing to learn about, whether that's one species of plant or one product or one method of uh, removal. And just like that trial and error, I think, will build your confidence in what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think I most of these, yep, sorry, most of these applications are just the, the quantity is minimal. And just as an example, yesterday I was working in the park with an AmeriCorps support team member and two volunteers, and we uh, freed 18 trees, which were heavily, heavily burdened by winter creeper, you know, vines as, you know, as big as this. And I used a total of about two ounces of mix. So that was one ounce of product. So that kind of gives you an idea of how how little you're actually uh, dispensing yeah. for something like, like a free a tree activity. Okay, so we have just a, a few more minutes left and I'd, I'd like to touch on a couple more things. Um, Japanese honeysuckle in the winter. What, what, uh, what are some best strategies for that particular invasive vine? Well, it's uh, still green in the winter, so it's an evergreen vine. Um, so foliar application of a glyphosate um, works really well. Um, and there's very little else usually surrounding honeysuckle that's alive right now, you know, so like that in the meadow setting or on the floor of the forest. So you have very little um, additional damage, I guess, to vegetation. Um, you can, if it's a small amount, you can try and cut it back or pull it back. Um, I haven't found that to be successful to eradicate it, but it's a good way to minimize um, the space it's taking up and maybe, you know, you can go at it at a different time if you want to eradicate it. Um, and then I had it, specifically, I had it throughout a meadow that I mentioned earlier, and we had tried pulling and we had tried spraying and, and, and neither were getting the result we wanted. And so a prescribed burn um, knocked it right back to its column, its starting point um, for about three years, which I was thrilled with because I wanted to put a burn in the meadow anyway. Um, so that was just a really nice kind of side effect, side bonus of having a prescribed burn. And did that allow you to go back in and, and more easily control? Yeah, yeah, it meant then like in two years time when it started um, getting over the shock of being burnt <laughs> and coming back out that I could see the starting points and I didn't feel like it was just everywhere, which was driving me crazy. So then I could see it. So then if I wanted to dig it up or grub it or spray it, 
you know, then it gave me a more directed um, approach to treating the, the starting point of the plant. Okay. And when you use glyphosate on Japanese honeysuckle in the winter, what is the, what is the latest you can spray? What are some timing guidelines there? I think you what can spray Japanese honeysuckle year round, but it's just depends on what else is growing there, you know, so it, it seems like a shame to spray in a winter evergreen in the growing season when you're going to have a lot of, you're going to kill everything your spray encounters underneath that vine. Um, so for environmental responsibility, I think it's better to do it when all of the surrounding vegetation is asleep and cozy underground. And so you can mm -hmm. just kill the target, the target plant, but it's available for spray year round. Okay. Thank you. And then one final, um, maybe two questions. So I, we also had several questions about managing, let me find my notes here, managing lesser celandine or celandine, depends on where you come from, I guess. And um, Laura, I know you touched on, you know, you all are gearing up to uh, your monitoring to control lesser celandine this spring. Um, can you talk a little bit about what control methods you use? Do you use uh, manual control at all or um, herbicide applications and timing? Sure. So we don't use manual control because we have too much of it. So if somebody has uh, a handful of plants that have popped up in their yard, a thorough, thorough digging and removal of all plant parts might do the trick followed by monitoring, but that's not an option. Uh, I think, you know, as everybody on the panel is, just knows as well as I do that you're going to end up spreading that plan because of the underground um, uh, system of it's it's to the risk, correct? Not rhizomatous. I, I, I'm i always getting like rhizomes and tubers mixed up in my head. Uh, so we do use full layer spray. Um, we'll be starting around the 1st of February and hopefully wrapping that up by mid-March. Uh, that's a because of course, lesser, uh, we we go we tend to call it fig buttercup, but emerges uh, in the winter and then outcompetes native spring ephemerals, um, and so you don't want to have non-target collateral damage to those spring ephemerals. Or the another big consideration is if you are working in areas where you may have amphibian activity uh, to protect um, them. So we're scouting. Uh, we're going to be establishing test plots for um, fig buttercup. And then I, you know, the, the timing is always, it's always late winter in the very, very beginning of spring. Um, and I think that there's often like this idea of about 50% flowering being prime time, not going too late and repeat. So we tend to go over these areas at least twice in that season. And um, then just generally speaking, I'm not sure if this came up, but just to be really clear for everyone, when you're foliar spraying, no matter what it is and when it is, you're, you're using the lowest concentrations. So we've been talking about concentrations for like woody species, but when you're doing foliar spray, these are very low concentrations. So we're using about a 2% concentration of uh, the aquatic safe glyphosate product with a non-ionic surfactant. Um, to help penetrate the cuticle of the plant. And you are not wetting that beat, you know, to the point of runoff. So those are some of the parameters. Thank you for that, Laura. And I think that is going to bring us to the end of our panel today. Um, I thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us today, Laura and Nicola and Cole, we really appreciate your time. And I, again, to the audience, you you asked so many wonderful and thoughtful questions today. And uh, if, if we did not answer your question, please send us an email and we will either contact one of the panelists or we will answer it for you at Google Prism. Um, Rowena, do you have any closing thoughts for us today? Um, well, you covered most of it, and we do want to thank um, all the donors yet again, because you guys really have made this possible, as well as the Virginia Environmental Endowment, who's been a big supporter of Blue Ridge Prism, and we couldn't be here with uh, all the work that we do without them. 
Um, one more reminder that upon leaving the Zoom webinar, you'll have the opportunity to complete a survey. And you won't see the survey until you click the leave button. So once you click that leave button, please take just a few minutes to fill out that survey and let us know how we did. We'd really appreciate it. But thank you so much. And unless you have anything else, Beth, I guess this meeting is adjourned. Thanks so much, everyone, thank for joining you. us. Thank you so much. Reach out for questions. And thanks to our panelists once again. We appreciate your time and partnership. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right, are we next? I guess we're done. Okay, I'm gonna end the meeting. All right, thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. We hope to see you all again. It was such a pleasure. You guys actually, does everyone wanna come back on? Give a quick wave to everybody before I end the meeting. <laughs> thanks everybody. Great meeting. Well, we're so, we're see so everybody. Great. And um, happy new year. We'll see you all soon. Have a Bye. Good Thank you. Bye. Bye.